Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I'm convinced that God is at work in our lives, that He oversees, that He supplies, that He guides us in ways that we cannot understand as part of that promise resulting from the fact that we depend upon Him and not our own resources or abilities or wisdom. And I'm also certain that God is at work in the life of this church. And in times of transition and change, we all keep our eyes on Him and have confidence that we are in His hands and that He sees what we do not. And even when we don't understand circumstances or the clouds are above us, yet on the other side is that face of God, the grace of God, and the love of God. As we approach Independence Day, I'm thinking of statements made at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 by Benjamin Franklin. And though as we look at our nation, none of us would say it's perfect or that everything that's happened in the past has been what it ought to be and certainly not in the present. But these words ring true yet today. I've lived a long time, sir. The longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? He went on to say, Without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interests. Our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business, and that one or more of the ministers of this city be requested to officiate in that service. How we need those words today in our nation. As we celebrate, as we rejoice, as we thank God for those protections and those liberties that we enjoy, how we echo the Word of God, that if we will trust Him with all our heart, if we don't lean on our own perception, our own opinion, but do the will of God, that He will see us through as individuals, as families, as a church family, as a state, and as a nation. Ello Sanderson wrote these words titled, The Providence of God. The mighty God, omniscient one, his ways we cannot trace. He reckons every good begun and crowns it with his grace. Lo, I can see him in his word. I will not doubt or fear. My steps are ordered of the Lord. His guiding hand is near. No trial can my spirit break, for God will not forsake. He will with each temptation make a way for my escape. The future beckons, and I bow. My God removes the care. Behold, he goes before me now, and he will my way prepare. He's here and there and everywhere. In all the ways I've trod, I've never passed beyond the sphere of the providence of God. How many of us can amen those words? God's blessings. There's a general providence. In fact, if you... Look at Matthew 5, 45. Everybody gets the sunshine and the rain regardless of their relationship to God. In Acts 17, 24 to 28, Paul preached to pagans and said, he hasn't left himself without witness. Here's the rain and the food and the joy and the life and the breath that he's given us. But then these specific promises given to those that are committed to loving him and honoring him that he would cause all things to work out for that which he knows is good. Or the fact that in those words we just heard, 
He makes a way of escape. He protects us in times of temptation. He knows what we are able to bear. When Jesus spoke about worry, he said, food, drink, clothing, how long you're going to live. He said, don't worry about those things. Consider the birds of the air, how God feeds them. And I want to add to that today. Consider the chickens at Gary Kaiser's house. You know, if I had to be a chicken, I'd want to be one of Gary and Kay's chickens. Wouldn't you? It's a reminder that so often God feeds the birds and the creatures on this planet through people and through other means that he has provided in ways that we don't understand. But Jesus said, look at the lilies or the grass. Look how beautiful God adorns that which will be mowed or cut or burned in the fire. Aren't you much more valuable than the plants or the birds? Seek first the kingdom of God and what all these things will be provided for you. That's the providence of God. And we see it all the way through scripture. Oh, look at Abraham and Isaac. God will provide. Oh, here's the ram sacrificed instead of his son. Joseph is talking with one of you this morning. Landon, I think, about the fact that everything in Joseph's life God worked through it, even things that were not endorsed by God, like the favoritism of his father, the jealousy of his brothers. But the Midianites came through and gave him a taxi ride to Egypt. He was promoted, falsely accused, put in prison. Then he's second to Pharaoh, and in that famine, God fed And Joseph was able to tell his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God intended it for good. Oh, Moses, and there's that basket and the water, his mother and his sister. And just at that time, Pharaoh's daughter comes to bathe. Ruth, oh, Naomi in a famine, moved from Bethlehem to Moab with her husband and sons. Ruth married one of the sons. Terrible things happened. Naomi's husband died. Ruth's husband died. Nobody would want that. And God certainly didn't directly cause that. But when there was bread in Bethlehem, they returned and Ruth met Boaz and became part of the lineage of King David and Jesus the Christ. Oh, David, he said, I've been a young man and now I'm an old man. Some of us can agree with that. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed, his children, begging for bread. In Psalm 139, where could I go from your presence? If I were to ascend to heaven, you're there. If I were to go down to Sheol, you're there. If I were to hide the remotest parts of the earth, even there, your hand will guide me. Ahab, where he was determined to protect himself from being attacked by the enemy, disguised himself. But one of the opponents pulled back and shot his arrow just at random And it hit the opening where he was unprotected and Ahab died. Oh, Esther, we've been studying about her and Mordecai, the king Ahasuerus and Haman, and even the king's insomnia played a part in all of that. But we need to make some distinctions regarding God providing for us. First of all, we're not talking about miraculous activity, but rather God's unseen hand working through circumstances and people and events and matters all around us. At the same time, we deny deism. You know, sometimes people are so resistant to modern-day biblical miracles, they swing to the other ditch and say, well, you know, God just sort of wound up the universe like a clock, and then he stepped away from it, now it runs on its own. Absolutely false. Providence, we want to say, is mysterious. And we have to be careful. For example, two young people might meet each other and they seem compatible and they click. It could be older people for that matter. Oh, it looks like, you know, God's hand is in this. God is indicating to me I'm supposed to marry this person or take this job or go uh, move to that direction because the pieces seem to be fitting. But you can't interpret providence at the present time. It's more looking back on your life and mine and the experiences God has given to this church. And so we don't rush to conclude and we must be so cautious, whatever age we are, 
Don't jump into something and say, oh, I can just tell this is exactly what God has supplied. We know that Satan is at work too. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, Paul said, I've wanted to visit you before, but Satan hindered us. He doesn't tell us how. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He said, it's a messenger from Satan to beat me up and discourage me. And so we look at events. We can't always put two and two together. We might get seven and a half. But we know that if we trust God, if we lean on him and not our own self-sufficient ways, that somehow he will work through the good and the bad, and he will help us if we put our confidence in him. That does not mean that everything turns out well. You know, sometimes a person survives an accident. We say, well, God, God was with him. Well, what about the person that didn't make it or that passed away from cancer or something happened, the loss of a job? Was God not with that person? Romans 8.31 says, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. The dangers that Christians face are not somehow eliminated. We're not immunized because God's hand is involved in our lives. And so in the midst of all these tragedies and the disasters and troubles, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why? Because those things can't separate us from the love of God. So if we were to look at Hebrews 11, those heroes of faith, some conquered kingdoms, put the foreign armies to flight, but otherwise, others lost their lives. Some were sawn in two. They lived in caves and holes in the ground. God provided. God was there. Whatever happens in our lives, God hasn't guaranteed that it's always going to be smooth and things turn out the way that we would like them to. Sometimes we're tested as to whether our trust is really in him or only in those things that we count to be the way we would choose. Cecil May, Jr., if you're looking for a good book to read, Providence, the Silent Sovereignty of God. And he uses the word perhaps, and he says that when you're facing something, perhaps God is involved there in some particular way. But be cautious again, be careful. He talks about free will and prayer, angels and the Holy Spirit, and how these teachings of the Word of God interact with providence. You know, we're left with saying in the words of Romans 11 toward the end of the chapter, who has known the mind of the Lord? His ways are unfathomable. His thoughts are so far above our own that when we consider these things, we're left in wonder and praise and awe. Before Paul was in prison in Rome, the reading that Mike brought from Philippians chapter 1, at that time, he had been taken from Caesarea, where he had previously been held for two years. And that journey in Acts 27, that's a remarkable demonstration of God's providence. Through the storms, through the wind, through the setbacks, through the delays, through the shipwreck, if you'd ever said to Paul, God's not with you, oh, yes, he is. And God brought the gospel to Rome, the capital of the world, through these circumstances. But I want us to go back to look at Caesarea and the events described there, partly because Tanya and I recently visited Caesarea and we were overwhelmed by the biblical events that took place there. Now, when I talked with you previously, we had a message about Mount Nebo, the view that Moses saw. And then we had the Jezreel Valley over near Megiddo. We talked about all the battles and the victories that God brought to those that served him. And then we had a BBS lesson on the Mount of Olives, of course, there in Jerusalem. 
But now we're going to go to Caesarea. I'd like to show you some things there and describe what took place in biblical times. As you look over to the right of the screen, you'll see Herod's promontory palace. We'll zoom in on the remains in a moment. There was a harbor that he built there, and over to the left, that tiny opening was the entrance to it, and there was breakwater, which is now underwater. And then you can see, perhaps in the distance, uh, the hippodrome, which uh, from the word for horse race, it was like an outdoor stadium, and uh, some other areas there, the theater, we'll go there in just a moment. Caesarea was uh, given to Herod by Augustus, and so Herod renamed it. It had been called Stratos Tower, but now in honor of the emperor, Caesarea. It had 100,000 population, larger than Jerusalem. That surprised me. 170 acres, and Herod used white stones, and he made everything to work reflect the sun. It was, it was gorgeous. It was magnificent. It was his home on the beach on the sea. He had constructed an aqueduct or a water pipe five miles long from Mount Carmel, we talked about a few weeks ago, with the ever so slight slope to bring that water all the way to Caesarea. Caesarea was the seat of the Roman government there, and so Pontius Pilate, for example, had his residence in that very city. I'll show you the inscription in just a moment. You look at the book of Acts, and you find in Acts chapter 8, after the baptism of the Ethiopian, who went on his way rejoicing, Philip moved on, and he settled in Caesarea. In chapter 21, calls him Philip the Evangelist. He'd been one of the deacons serving in Acts chapter 6. And he had four daughters also mentioned in chapter 21. Peter, the vision of the sheep, when he's in Joppa, and he's called, and the men from Cornelius, the Roman officer, come, and come with us. And where do they go? They go to Caesarea. And it's there where... Cornelius would have likely been stationed that Peter presented the good news and that entire family, all that were able to believe, were baptized into Christ. If you were to look at Acts 12, here's the theater where we stood. And Agrippa I, descended from Herod that built all of this, comes out dressed in these resplendent clothes, Josephus, the historian, describes this as well. And when he speaks, the people say, oh, it's the voice of a god and not a man. And uh, Agrippa won't give any credit to God. He receives all the adulation and acclaim, and he's struck with worms, and he dies. In the same place, Paul had visited three times. You see the references there. And then he was imprisoned two entire years. And there were three trials, if you will. He appeared before the governors, Felix and Festus, and then the son of Agrippa I, Agrippa II, was also involved. And from there, chapter 27, he went to Rome. So what happens in Acts is that Paul is warned time and time again, if you go to Jerusalem, they will lay hands on you and arrest you. He wants to do whatever God would have him do. So he goes, and in Jerusalem, chapter 21, he's arrested. And then there are plots to kill him. And so he's transferred to Caesarea. And we saw there, likely the place where Paul might have been kept in prison. But first I want to show you the Pilate inscription. This is the first and only reference to this governor outside of the New Testament. And while some said there never was such a man, then in 1961, scientists were excavating the theater, and this stone had been reused as a step as the theater was remodeled. Pontius Pilate, prefect. And that's very important, that word prefect, because it fits the New Testament. In the time described in the Word of God, the word procurator had not yet been used. Rather, the term was always prefect. 
And those writing by inspiration, the Gospels and Acts, describe Pilate with a term that fit that very period of time. Here's what's left of the promontory palace that jutted out to the Mediterranean. It's a reminder that the things that men build don't last. What God established, what God ordains, man cannot destroy. Just a beautiful area. You can imagine Herod and others looking out over the water. Here's what's left of the aqueduct, Tanya with our son Christopher. And you can go and see again the structure and the uh, scientific uh, technology they had in those days. The theater looked like this before some more renovations were made. And then when we were there at the Caesarea Theater, this is our group, we went in and we sat on those steps and we saw what was before us. Now there's a stage and more plays and other events take place there. Chairs are put down in the floor area as well. There's one spot we stood and the sign suggested this could be the place where Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. Acts 25, 11, and 12. Because he was a Roman citizen, providence of God, because the law of Rome allowed any such person to go before Nero himself, Paul could make that claim. Here are the remains, it's thought, of Paul's prison, and these are yet to be excavated. So it's a little bit tantalizing to stand on the other side of this fence and just imagine what they're going to find when they go down there. But the more man digs and the more man brings up and the more man sees, the more you and I see the providence of God, the power of God, the ability of God in non-miraculous ways, in circumstances and events and laws and people, it's often noted that Jesus came in the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4. 4. It was just the time in which the Roman roads had been built and the ships and the communication and the Roman peace throughout the world and Greek as more or less the universal language. And through all of it, perhaps not at the time, but now looking back, it was God's unseen hand and I'm telling you today that one day if you and I will keep our eyes on the Lord and not trust our own understanding but acknowledge him in all our ways we're going to look back and we're going to see that road we're going to see that avenue that opportunity or that challenge some of the decisions we make in life though we try to do the best we can we may later regret. I know a couple of moves that I've had our family make back in the years gone by. I look back now and I say, you know, if I had that to do over again, I, I wouldn't have done what I did. I would have come here about, I don't know how many years earlier. No regrets there. What a wonderful chapter. What a blessing all of you are for Tanya and for me. I, I can't say that enough. But you know, even in those decisions where we tried to put the Lord first and then we moved to work with a different church, we uprooted our family, we went here or there, there were lessons we were taught, there were things we realized, there were matters related to our own lives and our family that God even there brought the benefit. What might you have thought if you were on that ship in Acts 27 and it's breaking apart? Those who can swim, swim. Those who can't, grab a plank and float on it. Is God there? He was there. And Paul had said in that passage, I am confident not one life will be lost of all those that are on this ship. Blessings in a Roman prison. Let's go back to Philippians 1. Joy. Contentment, gratitude. These are the terms that describe the attitude of this apostle when one might easily become embittered or deny the hand of God 
as if he's absent, he doesn't care, he doesn't know. We've already said Paul was in Caesarea in that prison like a dungeon for two years. God was there. And now he's been brought across the sea through all of that challenge and difficulty, the shipwreck, the island of Malta, then another boat taking them on to Rome. And now here he is, as he had been in Caesarea, we understand now perhaps more like house arrest at the end of Acts 28. And what does he see as you look at verse 12? Is he angry? Is he upset? Is he losing his faith? No, he says, you know, I want you to know the gospel is advancing as it never has before. Jesus has said, you'll be my witnesses to the end of the earth. Acts 1, 8 and following. And now I want you to know my circumstances. Oh, they're terrible. Oh, they're awful. Oh, no. Look how they turned out. Brothers and sisters, you never know when a setback in your life, a difficulty, a concern, a barrier in your life might allow God to work through you to tell someone about Jesus in a way that you never could have before. Even from a sick bed, even from declining health or loss of a job or whatever it might be. And then Paul said, everyone here knows why I am here. This imperial Guard, verse 13. Everyone recognizes I'm here for the cause of Christ, for what I believe. Hey, what is your faith worth to you? Is it worth going to jail? It was for Paul because he's an ambassador, he's in chains, and you can't change who he is no matter what you where you put him. This guard. If you were to turn quickly over to chapter 4, 19, I believe it is, Paul says the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Wow, what a statement that is. No, 19 is another favorite. It's a provident statement, 4, 19. I was close. God will supply all your needs. That's providence. According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But the verse I was thinking of was 422. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. How did they get to be saints? They all know I'm telling them about Jesus Christ. In fact, the brethren, when they learned that I'm facing this because of my commitment to the Lord, they're not silencing themselves. They're not hiding in the corner. They're more bold and confident than they ever were before. They have more faith and less fear. Well, there are these enemies. They're moved by envy and strife, and they want to increase my distress. Does that mean God is not involved? God's not present? Of course not. Because that then allows Paul to be even more persistent and faithful in his adversity. My enemies. Got to be thankful for those enemies. They're telling everybody they can about Jesus. Because they think if they talk about Jesus, the authorities will come down harder on me. So I say, preach it, friend. Tell it to the world. And if it makes it worse for me, I believe God can bring something good out of it. Even from those bad actors. You Philippians, hey, your prayer life has increased because of what I'm going through. Think of the benefit of that to you. I know I'm going to be delivered. In fact, he speaks of this confident hope and expectation. Well, Paul, that means you're going to live, right? Whether by life or death. God will deliver me from death or God will deliver me through death, but God will deliver me. And I am sure of the provision, your Bible might say, supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ no matter what happens. There's a choice that I have. Christ will be magnified in my life and my body. I will not be ashamed. They can whip me. They can mistreat me. They can hurt me. They can kill me. But there's a choice they can't take away. That is, I will glorify Christ whether I live or 
die. If I live, hey, to live is Christ. If I die, to die is gain. More than conquerors, I cannot lose. Sometimes we wish we could see the hand of God and know exactly what he's up to and what he's doing. But our faith grows, I believe, through the mystery, through the perhaps, through the uncertainty, through the learning to lean on God and do as best we can, seeking to honor him and walk in his light. And then no matter what may come, when all is said and done, you and I around the throne of God and we'll say as the song David led, God will make a way even when there is no way. Remember the promise with which we began. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding. Have you crossed that step to put on Jesus Christ in baptism? To die to self and the old ways and rise saved, forgiven, a saint on that path and enjoying his special providence in ways we cannot see but that we know are real. If you are concerned about anything in your relationship to God, any way that we can help, we're going to stand and sing to encourage you. Won't you come?